Hi everyone, in this video I will be focusing on MEMS and MEMS sensors that are used in wearable technology like smartwatches and fitness bands today. I'll also talk about potential sensors that could be integrated into wearable devices in the future. What does MEMS stand for? It stands for Microelectromechanical Systems, which is the term used in the US. Micro implies it's something that has components lesser than one millimeter in size. Electro implies that there is an electrical interface or a component. Mechanical implies a moving part or some part whose mechanical properties are exploited. System basically means that all the above come together to form a function. Rephrasing the definition, MEMS are devices with micrometer size structures whose electrical and mechanical properties we exploit in order to sense the environment or affect it. MEMS can be made to function as either a sensor or an actuator. As examples of actuators, this is a micromirror actuator used in Texas Instruments DLP projector. This is a gear mechanism fabricated by Sandia Labs to demonstrate MEMS actuation capabilities. As examples of sensors, this is a single sensor of an infrared image sensor array by Honeywell. Another example of a sensor is this accelerometer, which is one of the most commonly used MEMS sensor. Note the comb shaped structures. These are capacitors whose capacitance changes as an acceleration is applied. Now for an important question, why do we need MEMS? One obvious reason is that they are very small. This translates to a smaller power consumption allowing for use with tiny batteries or small solar cells. And because of the fact that they have small mass and volume, their time constants are very small, allowing for rapid sensing or actuation. They also hi have very high sensitivity due to their high surface to volume ratio compared to micro scale structures. As mentioned previously, in the ongoing trend for manufacturing wearable technology, the small size of MEMS and low power is proving to be invaluable. Due to the high surface to volume ratio, small scale physical forces like Van der Waals forces become prominent. Surface tension and capillary action also have a significant effects in the especially in the microfluidic devices which are MEMS devices with or without electronic components. Due to their small size and relative ease at which uh, they can be shielded, they are shock proof and radiation proof which is good for fitness devices. Another couple of reasons that makes MEMS highly feasible is that they require the same fabrication equipment as that of IC fabrication. Ability to be batch fabricated like ICs also is key in lowering the cost per device. This is a really cool scanning electron microscope image of a micromirror actuator developed by Sandia Labs and that is a dust mite that's even smaller than the size of an ant's head. Notice the comb structures on the sides. These are capacitors just like those in, in an accelerometer but here a voltage is applied to generate a movement in order to rotate the gears. Shown in this video is an example of a linear motion actuator. It consists of two arms driven by a, in a particular pattern just by the thermal expansion of these arms. Applying a potential difference across these at, a, at a, uh, particular frequencies causes the arms to heat up, causing it to increase in length. This simple technique, when used in a repeated motion with a particular frequency, causes the central shaft to move along one dimension, here horizontally. One important observation here is the frequency of operation. As shown, the actuators are able to contract and expand at very high frequencies that is not possible to even see. This is made possible due to the inherent low time constants in MEMS devices due to its low thermal mass. It is possible to imagine a large number of practical uses for such a device like microrobotic insects, microsurgical robots and so on. This image shows an actuator developed in the University of Washington for use as a robotic micro leg similar in function to caterpillar legs. As you can see, the structure is attached to the substrate only at the center. Everywhere else, it is freely suspended. This is a typical kind of suspended structure often seen in MEMS sensors or microheaters. The image is an RF inductor suspended over a cavity. Let me show you a simple MEMS sensors working and its fabrication. We will look at how a simple pressure sensor works and how it is manufactured. The three main parts of the sensor are the diaphragm, air cavity and the piezoresistors. The top view on the left shows the arrangement of the resistors on the diaphragm. When there is a pressure difference between the cavity and the outside, the diaphragm stretches like a balloon to maintain equilibrium. The stretching of the diaphragm produces a force on the piezoresistors which causes them to change their resistance. 
This change in resistance is thus a mes measure of the degree of expansion of the diaphragm, which in turn is proportional to the pressure difference. The piezo resistors are connected to a V-stone bridge and uh, analog to digital converters to get a digital readout. This is how a simple pressure sensor cavity is made. We start with the regular silicon wafer. We deposit the material chosen to be the diaphragm, in this case silicon nitride. We then deposit and pattern the piezo resistor layer, which is not shown in the image. Then we flip, flip the wafer and deposit a photo, uh, photo resist and pattern it in order to define the cavity. Then the exposed areas of silicon are etched anisotropically with say a chemical such as KOH. The etch stops automatically upon reaching the silicon nitride layer. The photoresist is then removed and another silicon or pyrex wafer is bonded to the open side of the cavity to seal it off. This is how most basic structures are fabricated. As mentioned earlier, VLSI and MEMS have a difference in their structure as shown in these two images. On the left is a transistor which consists of layers stacked on top of each other, all glued or fixed in place. On the right is a typical MEMS stru structure with at least one part free to move with at least one degree of freedom. But since both use the same fabrication facility and starting materials, why not put them on the same wafer? Well, this is what major companies are focusing on. This concept is part of the more than Moore concept that we'll see in the following slides. According to Moore's law, the number of transistors will double every 18 months. But in a few years, transistors will reach a fundamental limit in size after which only a major change in technology that is also feasible will allow for a smaller transistors like quantum computing or carbon nanotubes. Thus, transistor density will become more or less constant. But Moore's law deals with only transistors that consists of only 10% of a whole system. The other 90% consists of interconnects, resistors, etc. True miniaturization is thus possible only when all these are scaled down. This is achievable by combining all parts and functions into a single chip called system on package. This gave rise to the more than more concept. Instead of cramming more transistors into a given area to increase speed and power efficiency, it would be more valuable if more functions could be performed in the same area. That is, to increase the functional density instead of transistor density, leading to a new class of mega-functional electronics. This image here shows the more than more concept graphically. A large number of functions are being performed by a single system. There are MEMS devices, memory chips, RF functionalities, analog processing circuits and optical circuits and so on, packed into a common composite layer. Wearable technology will hugely benefit from this concept as it enables a larger function set to be incorporated in the device. In this evolution towards smaller devices with more functionalities, MEMS occupies a unique place due to its advantages. Commercial MEMS technology is growing more and more common. A few products that use MEMS are thermal cameras, car airbag systems, smartphones, smartwatches, virtual reality headsets like Oculus Rift and Google Glass. Most here use the MEMS accelerometer and gyroscopes. Another important area for MEMS that will be incorporated into wearable technology is BioMEMS and there is an extensive research being done to use MEMS in the field of medicine. There are already devices for monitoring blood pressure and other parameters, micro syringes for painless injections, microstructures to manufacture biomolecules, pacemakers to maintain heart rhythm and diagnostic devices using microfluidics. The image shown here of the eye shows a MEMS pressure, pressure sensor in a contact lens by Sensimed that monitors the eye pressure for glaucoma diagnosis. Let's talk about why we need MEMS in wearable devices. Since wearable technology requires the function of activity and environment monitoring, it needs sensors. Since power consumption is a problem for portable electronics, MEMS offers an effective low power solution for this purpose. The most important and widely used sensor in wearable devices is the accelerometer. The gyroscope is usually used uh, in conjunction with the accelerometer to provide complete positional information that is crucial for motion tracking. The accelerometer chip shown on the left by analog devices consists of the MEMS sensing structure in the middle along with the required signal conditioning circuitry. Now, how about adding an artificial nose to your wearable device. Researchers are now looking to go beyond just accelerometers. 
Wouldn't it be a nice feature if your smartphone could smell the environment around you and warn you of potential air quality hazards? Such an electronic nose can also be made to warn people with asthma of potential allergens in the air, detect dangerous gases in the air which could be life-saving for people like miners, and by forming a network of connected devices, it would be possible to draw a map of air quality data visually displayed across the region on a map. It will also be a huge advantage when preventing explosions or terrorist attacks. Since security scans are limited to places like airports, it would be great if these explosives are detected in unsecured areas that people walk by every day. The MEM sensors have proven to be so sensitive that even a few molecules of explosive particles can be detected. Another important area of usage would be to detect harmful or prohibited chemicals used in food items or detect drugs or poison that might have been added to food or drinks. This high sensitivity can be obtained by using MEMS resonance sensors, which can detect small changes in resonant frequency very accurately. It consists of a micro-sized beam fixed at both ends, and its resonant frequency is continuously monitored. If there is a deviation in this resonant frequency, it is sensed by the monitoring circuit and represents a change in the mass of the beam or a change in the stress on the beam. This graph shows a typical frequency response of a resonator. The peak represents the res resonance frequency. When the mass or the stress on the resonator changes, the resonant frequency changes. Uh, this uh, change in the frequency corresponds to the amount of change in mass or stress. A stretched guitar string is a good example of a resonator. When the string is plucked, it resonates corresponding to its thickness or mass and how tightly it is stressed. The resonant frequency in the formula depends on the spring constant or the stress and the mass. Any change in the mass or tension causes a change in the resonant frequency. The resonator described in the previous slide is a miniature version of the guitar string that has very high quality factor and is much more sensitive to changes. The quality factor or Q is a measure of the sharpness of the peak and is key in determining the sensitivity. MEMS resonators have very high values of Q, which makes them very sensitive and less prone to noise issues. Summarizing MEMS resonators, they use high frequency signals, which allows for high sampling rates and immunity from low frequency noise. They have high Q, which results in good insensitivity to noise and higher sensitivity. It consumes low power, it's not uh, susceptible to shock and costs very little to manufacture. This is a representation of a MEMS resonance sensor. It consists of a resonator beam on which a thin layer of particular polymer is deposited. The polymer layer is sensitive to only a narrow range of molecules to which it can attach to. For example, organic molecules that have a nitrate group. When the molecules attach to this polymer layer, its mass and stress changes, causing a shift in the resonance frequency. It can be made so sensitive that they can detect even single molecules. My research deals with developing such highly sensitive chemical sensors using graphene. To successfully create commercial electronic sniffers, the sensor must be able to sense a wide range of chemical species. Since one resonator can sense only one kind of chemical, there needs to be a large array of such sensors, each with a different sensing polymer. It is possible to create such arrays and coat each resonator using in inkjet printing techniques. As more selective polymers are invented, it is possible that in the future, a nose that has the same range of smelling ability as humans, but a million times more sensitive, can be created. A large array of resonance sensors is shown in this picture, each with a different polymer for sensing different kind of chemicals. These graphs by IHS represent the trends in number of shipments and revenue from wearable technology in the near future. There is an expectation of an exponential growth from this multi-billion dollar industry and it shows no sign of stopping. Therefore, research in this technology is ripe and I encourage anyone interested to pursue research in this area. In conclusion, we saw a brief introduction into MEMS and MEMS sensors and its relation to VLSI technology. And then we saw the current push away from Moore's law to more than Moore, a few examples of wearable technologies and their sensors, and the future of wearable technology and potential of adding new MEMS sensors to this technology. I will leave you with this picture of a microscopic image written in the nanoscale. It is part of a talk by Richard P. Feynman, regarded by many as a founding father of nanotechnology. Hope this lecture was useful to you. Thank you for listening.